if you are hearing me uh, my job was to introduce me to the participants of this meeting so i just gave a brief introduction about uh, uh, you uh, as i know you well so uh, i have given you uh, an introduction about you and this meeting is a part of the anti saffron terrorism day on uh, january 30th this date when gandhi was assassinated and we uh, take a pledge on this day like anti saffron pledge uh, on this day so uh, comrade tyagu has been conducting this meeting for long and uh, this is uh, what we call in tamil fascist edirpu makkal munani it is a anti fascist people's front um, so uh, he have we have been consistently uh, voicing against uh, uh, the hindu fundamentalism uh, growing in india and uh, we want to always safeguard our homeland so we always uh, although they are not a very big potential force in tamil nadu and we take care that they never become a potential force over here we have to keep exposing them here and we have to keep telling uh, about what they have been doing across the country so we uh, have been like uh, uh, closely doing the, this thing, things and uh, i would uh, welcome you to deliver your address now over to rampuriyan okay thank you avarku mute eduthunga mute mute edukana avarku rampuriyan ah okay Welcome. thank you thank you comrade tyagrajan and my old friend uh, and uh, close friend muthu uh, i am very glad to be talking to friends like you uh, first of all let me congratulate you that uh, you are keeping up this campaign against uh, uh, hindutva nationalism uh, which is i think a big menace to our indian democracy on the top of it it believes in a ideology of uh, hindi hindu hindustan that's uh, another reason that uh, uh, those particularly uh, who are in non speaking areas should be more concerned about the rise of the, this power uh, which is trying to impose uh, hindi language and a particular type of religion which is not uh, the hinduism of uh, masses which is not the hinduism of what uh, hinduism which mahatma gandhi practiced so i first of all congratulate you that you are consistently uh, exposing such forces and on this 30th january as we celebrate the martyrdom day of uh, uh, father of the nation mohandas karamchand gandhi uh, it is in the fitness of things that we try to understand number 1 what are his uh, what was his ideology number 2 how he struggled hard to ensure that india becomes a nation because uh, this particular concept that we are a nation from times immemorial is totally fallacious and mahatma gandhi apart from other things his anti colonial movement was struggled was a path through mass movements it was not just a sort of a displacing the british powers with the local people it was also an attempt to have mass movement where people form a nation and that's what that's how india became a nation now firstly briefly let's see that uh, mahatma gandhi was uh, born in a family where his mother was belonging to a Uh, uh hindi a uh, very interesting hindu sect which is called pranam panthi now pranam panthi this hindu sect how what is its peculiarity what is its speciality they believe in many of the sufi saints they are not narrow in their understanding of religion and they try to pick up good things from muslim saints of india in particular now second thing i want to point out when mahatma gandhi went to england please note that already in his family there was a type of hinduism where islam was not a anathema where islam was not regarded as anything bad and in britain he came in contact with many christian missionaries now these christian missionaries tried to convert him he did not mind interacting with him but he did not convert he did not convert but in the process 
he tried to understand the best things from Christian religion, like Sermon on the Mount, Mount. Sermon on the Mount influenced him maximally. Thirdly, I must say, he had a lot of impact of Jainism and this particular variety of background because of which he was a strong believer of non-violence. So these are the four uh, philosophical uh, rootings of the father of the nation, which we should try to understand. Now, somehow he became very conscious about injustice. So in South Africa, when he saw that Indians living there are being treated like dogs, worse than slaves. And uh, we all recall his very important experience when he was thrown out from first class compartment because he was an Indian regarded as black. So this was one of the major transformative elements which converted Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi into Mahatma Gandhi. So what we see here that a openness about religion comes into his background. Second, protesting against injustice comes begins with this South Africa. And when it comes to India, he first tries to do a yatra, travels all over the country in third class railway compartment. I think many of our young friends may not be knowing that Indian railways had first initially first class, second class, and the third class. So the most deprived class, he traveled all over India. And this is what gave him the insight into what India really is. And from here, when he saw the uh, immense poverty, misery of farmers and the workers, working people, he abandoned his those uh, pant, shirt, jacket type clothes and came to that uh, dhoti which became a very peculiar feature of his clothing all through his life. So, meanwhile, in India, of course, Indian National Congress, which was formed on the basis of pluralism, inclusivity, and of course, it was a mix. There were a lot of conservative elements. There were a lot of progressive elements. But mainly, it was pursuing the path which can lay the foundation of a secular nation. So Indian National Congress had some retrograde elements, but still its most secular people were also trying to oppose the British rule through petitions, through articles, through representing in certain bodies and opposing British rule. Now, this is what is the greatest role of Gandhi. He transformed this anti-British uh, letter writing into a mass movement. And this mass movement was not restricted to elite or one religion or one section of the population. And in 1920, we see that he starts non-cooperation movement, which is open to participation by most of the people. I must point out here at this point that it was after Mahatma Gandhi's non-cooperation movement that the communal forces which were already there in the form of a Muslim League and Hindu Mahasabha, they became more worried and they tried to strengthen themselves. This was also, also the point where people like Jinnah left the Congress and later, of course, after a few years, many years, he came back into Muslim League with the ideology that Muslims are a nation. On the other side, Hindu nationalism, was being articulated by Savarkar. Of course, in 1923, that comes out in the form of uh, Hindus or our uh, uh, this uh, on the book of Hindutva, where he tries to say that this is a Hindu nation and Christian and Muslims, they are the foreigner, foreigner, they are foreign religions. So essentially, this is a Hindu religion, uh, this thing. And here he coins a word called Hindutva. Now, Hinduism word is already there, which connotes religion. And here he brings in the word Hindutva, which means total Hinduness. And in this total Hinduness, friends from Tamil Nadu should particularly note that he emphasizes on Aryan race. He emphasizes on the culture here, the Brahminical culture and the land. 
So this becomes the foundation of Hindutva. Uh, so Hindu Mahasabha uh, later on adopts this as its credo. And after this, in 1925, inspired by Savarkar's idea, Hindu nationalist RSS comes, which is the one of the biggest and most threatening organization of the country and the biggest organization all over the country. So in 1920, when Mahatma Gandhi launched non-cooperation movement, it had to be withdrawn because of Chauri Chaura. And he was very serious about uh, non-violence. And later on, he tried to give a direction to the Congress. And this was the phase one where his message started reaching far and wide. The main importance is that anti-British struggle and social reform, they merge in due course over a period of time. And he spends, many people who join him get inspired by him, get inspired by the strength of his uh, moral, get inspired by his moral strength, his total commitment to throwing out the British rule. Of course, it was not that direct as soon as possible, uh, as soon as uh, it began. But later on, the second major movement, civil disobedience movement, where he said that we will not pay taxes to the British. And along with this, please remember, there was Dandi March that solved Satyagraha. Now, in this period, first I introduced the word nonviolence. Now I am bringing the word called Satyagraha, invocation to the truth. So these became the two major foundations of Gandhi's ideology, which was to attract large number of people. So in 1930, this salt satyagraha, salt uh, movement, Dandi March, this was one of the major events. And if one wants to see uh, that how masses can be involved in the movement, salt satyagraha, I think, is one of the best well-organized, uh, uh, well-organized movement, and. The type of repression. Now, uh, he took uh, in his whole course of the journey from Sabarmati to Dandi. On the way, people get um, kept getting inspired, inspired by him, kept joining in large number. So there were a lot of rules which were laid out. But the major rule was that people will remain non-violent. People will offer satyagraha. People will march. And in Dandi, when he went on the seashore, he took the handful of salt and that broke the British law. British government was very repressive and its uh, aggression on the uh, non-violence believing people, it caught the imagination of the world. There were some reporters, when they saw this whole march, they reported through, tele at that time there used to be telegram, of course, now the different telegram has come up, but through telegram and uh, post, it spread all over the world like a wildfire as to Gandhi is leading a march against the British Empire. People doubted how making some salt is a challenge to British Empire. But let's see it this way, that any struggle, if it has a participation of masses, if it is done in the language which masses understand. And Gandhi maintained that, what he called Sarv Dharma Samabhav, means he respected morality of religion. His religion was not of rituals. His religion was not bowing blindly to the holy books. His religion was not bowing to the clerical, clerical elements of the religion. His religion was a sort of his own concept of God. And picking up moral values from different religions. That's why his Ram and BJP's Ram, they are totally different. His Ram represent a sort of a universal spirit, while BJP's Ram is a exclusive Ram of Hindutva, which targets Muslims and also Christians. Please note, Christians I will not be referring too much because they are just 2.3%, but in due course, they were also targeted for that. So this was a process of nation building, which people don't emphasize. Now, of course, then he had uh, differences with Ambedkar on the question of separate electorate, because he did not want the anti-colonial movement to get divided. 
he wanted to maintain a particular type of a Hindu unity. And in his eyes, Hindu unity meant that uh, untouchability and those things have no place in our society. He went on to say that if untouchability survives, Hinduism has no right to exist as a religion. He went that far. And of course, after that Pune Pact with uh, Ambedkar, in which uh, instead of separate electorate for Dalit, which might have annoyed the upper caste who were also part of the anti-colonial struggle, he went for reserved constituency for Dalits. And I'm using the word Dalits very broadly. And in this anti, uh, in this uh, reservation uh, affirmative action, he gave double the seats to the Dalits as far as in Pune Pact was concerned. Now, other major thing which comes up here is that after this pact, after this pact, Gandhi actually changed, changed a bit. And the change was due to interaction with Ambedkar. Gandhi realized that Ambedkar himself a Dalit, talking of equality of the caste, rather Ambedkar talked of annihilation of caste. And this is what Gandhi undertook from 1933. Please note, that from 1933, Gandhi did not emphasize on any political action. He took out yatras, what I will call pilgrimages. Yatra is, a, I mean, sort of it has a religious connotation in India, and that's why they call it yatra. It is a sort of a, it has a spiritual component in this. He took out many yatras from village to village, city to city, with the sole goal to eradicate untouchability. I'll request you <clears throat> to see if the uh, clippings of uh, uh, Sham Benegal's film, Sham Benegal's serial, Bharat Ek Khoj, unfortunately it is in Hindi, if it is dubbed in English, please see how many young congressmen inspired by Gandhi spread all over in different villages, opposing this uh, caste system, opposing the thing that uh, untouchability, about untouchability, it was a deep thing. Of course, initially, Gandhi did believe in Varna system. But we can't see Gandhi as a static figure, which many of us try to see. As he goes down under the this thing, he goes on changing his concept about ka uh, Varna, caste. And of course, of course, I will hold Ambedkar more authentic and more, uh, more for the social equality annihilation of caste. But Gandhi, in his own way, had a large impact in working against untouchability. Now comes 1939, the beginning of Second World War. Now, at the beginning of Second World War, now here I must say that Subhash Chandra Bose, I would like to delve a bit into Subhash Chandra Bose also, because he is also one of the major freedom fighters of India. Now, Subhash Chandra Bose here disagreed with the Indian National Congress Central Committee, which decided that we should launch a anti-British movement. We should launch a mass movement against British, because British that time were trying to uh, say that India will stand against Germany, Japan, Axis powers in the war. So Congress said, how can you take us for granted? You have to give us, initially, they were talking of dominion status, but later on, mainly because of pressure of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and Jawaharlal Nehru type people, that they talked of total independence. Now here, two things came up. On one side, Congress stood with Gandhi that we will launch a mass movement. On the other side, Subhash Chandra Bose said, enemies, enemy is our friend. So Britain is our enemy and Germany and Japan are enemies of Britain. So we should ally with Germany and Japan to defeat the, defeat the British forces. Now, Central Committee of the Congress totally disagreed with that. And in 1942, on 8th August, in Bombay, in a maidan called August Kranti Maidan, a resolution was passed that British quit India. In Hindi, Angrezo Bharat Chodo. 
And interestingly, this British quit India was word coined by one of the socialist leaders of that time, whose name was Yusuf Meher Ali. Okay, but as this was launched, uh, the British uh, forces, British government swooped on the Congress leadership and they imprisoned most of the Congress leaders. That time, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad was the president of Indian National Congress. And uh, barring few of them, uh, the Congress, Congress became devoid of leadership. And Gandhi also gave a call that let's do everything to get freedom or let's die. Karo ya maro. So these were the two guiding principles of 1952 Quit India Movement, which was initiated by that. And this is where how uh, at the end of the war, uh, British forces, uh, British powers did decide that now India is becoming unmanageable. There is a lot of rebellion. People at that time in 1942, because Congress leadership was all in jail, people became autonomous. And at different places, they started taking out processions, damaging British property, hoisting tricolor at different places. And of course, the government was very repressive and it tried to do this thing. Now, before I, before I come further, I will give another example of uh, which relates to first Bhagat Singh and then uh, of course, Subhash Chandra Bose also I'll elaborate a uh, bit. And then uh, these two things, let's see. Now, in Maharashtra in particular, as uh, I think our comrade initially said about Gorse, lot of films are coming up, lot of plays are coming up, glorifying Gorse. And in one of the film clip, Gorse says that he was forced to kill Gandhi because Gandhi, apart from other things, also did not do anything to save Bhagat Singh from being hanged. Now, nothing can be further than truth because in uh, that time, the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, at the time of his farewell also, and in other accounts also, it comes out that Mahatma Gandhi wrote two letters to Lord Irwin that Bhagat Singh is a patriot. He has not done this because of some personal goal, so he should not be hanged. Now, Lord Erwin actually wanted to consider it, but in due course, he found that if he goes for this, many of the British officers threatened him that if you think of uh, reducing the punishment of Bhagat Singh, we will resign en masse. So all the officers in Punjab, British officers, and who were... Uh, Saunders was murdered and Bhagat Singh was part of the plot. They came forward and they threatened the Viceroy that we will resign from our post. Now, when this happened, in one of the films, Nathuram Gorse is shown as saying, uh, this, uh, as saying that in 1931, Bhagat Singh was hanged. After that, there was a Karachi Congress. And in Karachi Congress, a resolution was passed that we condemn the British government for hanging a brave patriot like Bhagat Singh. So, Gorse, in one of the clips, this film, which is based on falsehoods, says that I was annoyed with Gandhi because Gandhi opposed the resolution which condemned the British government for hanging Bhagat Singh. I did some investigation and research and I came to know that it was Mahatma Gandhi himself who had drafted that resolution condemning the British government. So please see the ploy of this uh, Hindutva forces, how they can manipulate things to go on for this. Now, of course, after 1945, then tragically, he is also blamed for partition of the country. Nothing can be farther from truth. Let me point out that partition mainly took place because of the British policy of divide and rule, number one. Number two, Savarkar's ideology that there are two nations here, a Muslim nation and a Hindu nation. And later on, Muslim League anyway wanted a separate nation based on Islam. So they passed a resolution that we want in 1940, Muhammad Ali Jinnah 
made Muslim League accept that uh, there should be a separate state for Muslims in the country. And bus, of course, let me point out here, Pakistan, East Pakistan, West Pakistan came to be formed on the ground of religion. Religion dominated in politics to a great extent. See the two trajectories. First trajectory was when they tried to impose Urdu as the national language of Pakistan, East Pakistan people who are Bangla speaking, they totally separated from that. See the second tragedy of a nation based on religion. Today you are seeing Pakistan is in the dire straits. Even India's economy is worsening, but Pakistan's economy is close to a collapse. Let me make an incidental point here. Mahatma Gandhi always said that I am a Sanatani Hindu. I am a Hindu, for example, but I can even sacrifice my life for my religious principle, but that is my personal matter. The state for whose fashioning I am struggling, that state will not be guided by religion A or religion B or religion C. So basically, this whole concept of secularism was deep-rooted in Mahatma Gandhi's ideology, where religion's moral values, I understand it this way, Gandhi belonged to a stream of religious people who focused on morality. And Muslim League, Hindu Mahasabha, they picked up identity aspects of religion to, to mobilize the communities for their political goals. So these are the two things here, incidentally, but we must see that Mahatma Gandhi I did point out that. Anyway, I was talking of partition. Uh, some detailed time, please try to uh, understand, try to read that British were also keen on dividing the country. So first is communal forces wanted separate nation for each of them. Muslim League wanted separate Pakistan and Hindu Mahasabha RSS wanted that they cannot separate. They should remain part of this as secondary citizens and as uh, Hindutva ideologue Gorse's Guru, Guru Golwalkar, wrote that uh, the uh, Christians, sorry, Muslims, Christians, and communists, these are the three threats for India. And as far as Muslims and Christians are concerned, they should live here at the mercy of the majority community. They don't deserve citizens' right. And incidentally, he appreciates Hitler's policy against Jews. Now, this is Golwalkar, from whom Godse picked up his nationalism. He says that uh, Jew, Germans have showed us the path, how a nation is to be built. And the treatment they gave to the Jews is something which needs to be emulated by uh, us. And these uh, people belonging to non-Hindu religion, they should be uh, live here at the mercy of the majority community, deserving no citizen's right. So partition is a complicated process. But by this time, Nathuram Godse, who was initially member of RSS, he was the RSS Pracharak. In 1938, he joined Hindu Mahasabha and he was a disciple, close disciple of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. Now, attacks on Mahatma Gandhi's life, what? Gorse killed him in third, on 30th January 1958, uh, 1948. This was the fifth attack on Mahatma Gandhi. First attack took place on 1935. Now, many times they say it is because of the partition that they wanted to kill Gandhi. It was because 55 crores Mahatma Gandhi wanted to give to Pakistan that he was killed. Now, tell me, in 1935, there was no, no talk of Pakistan. There were no talk of 55 crores. So that, of course, they try to link up this 55 crores. I will come to that controversy also. Now, as we come down, uh, partition became a reality. And mainly the people who were handling politics. By as, we came, uh, as we came close to independence, as we came close to independence, uh, that time, a lot of, uh, as migrations took place, Muslims started going to Pakistan. Many Hindus, like even my, my, for, uh, my grandfather and all that, they migrated from Pakistan to here. 
and there was intense communal violence. Gandhi that time left the political uh, theater to his disciples, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Patel in the main, and he acted as one man army to quell the communal violence which was brooding. Now, uh, at this point, as on one side, India is getting independence, India is getting partition. At the same time, the communal violence is going up. So Gandhi at this time decides to go on a fast till death. And what are the conditions for fast in death? It was not related to 55 crores. I'll come to 55 crores. It was mainly related that the Muslim refugees, Muslims who have left their houses and mosques, their houses and mosques should not be appropriated by the Hindus led by RSS group of people. So that was the main condition of the fast. And he wanted communal peace because of which he went on fast uh, for a long time. Now, this was attributed to that he wanted to give 55 crores to Pakistan because of which he undertook the fast. I'll request you, this is available on Google, conditions put by Gandhi for leaving his fast. And in that 55 crores is not mentioned. Now, what is this 55 crore business? Now, 55 crores was part of the treasury. It was divided based on population between India and Pakistan. So out of this total uh, revenue of the country, 75 crores came on the, uh, on, on, for Pakistan, out of which 20 crores were transferred to Reserve Bank of India in Karachi much before freedom and 55 crores were remaining. Meanwhile, the issue of Kashmir came up. So many people told Gandhi, uh, told the government that this 55 crores should not be given unless the Kashmir problem is solved. Gandhi said, 55 crore is our moral commitment. If we back out from moral commitment and this money belongs to Pakistan, if two brothers are separating, the each property is earmarked for them because that time, Kashmir was not a part of India. So Gandhi morally just said it is it will be right that 55 crores, which belongs to Pakistan, should be given to them. So this, in nutshell, was the uh, basic cause of 55 crores. And Nathuram Godse, uh, this was a fifth attempt. Because Mahatma Gandhi was able to talk, mobilize majority of Hindus, majority of Muslims, majority of Christians in the national struggle. And Hindu nationalists led by Savarkar, RSS and others, they wanted a Hindu nation here. Please note, when Indian constitution came up, when tri tricolor was declared as a flag of India, RSS mouthpiece organizer and uh, uh, Panchajanya, they opposed the constitution. RSS did not uh, hoist tricolor on its head office for 52 long years. Now, lately under pressure, they are doing it. So basically, what do we learn from Gandhi? And what is the threat to Gandhi? As you are talking against uh, fascism, saffron fascism, the basic point of RSS is that we are a Hindu nation. And if I want to contrast and totally put forward the ideology of this saffron uh, politics here, please take two examples. On one side, Bhim Rao Baba Sahib Ambedkar burns Manusmriti and he goes, goes on to become chief of the drafting committee of India's constitution. So this is on one side. On the other side, there is RSS and Hindu nationalist forces who uphold Manusmriti even today and they oppose the values of Indian constitution. Today, the major threat which is posed to the Indian nationalism led by Gandhi, major threat is because of this attack on values of liberty. Our freedom is being curtailed. Equality is not being accepted. See the economic disparity which is increasing. Poor are getting poor, rich are, rich are getting richer. And the rights of Dalits, they are trying to, in the form of preservation, they are trying to erode wherever possible. As far as women's freedom is concerned, women's freedom is also being trying to curtail 
through the campaigns like love jihad our freedom to choose our food is being curtailed through campaigns like cow beef lynching and other things so this saffron fascism has not only created a mass psychology mass psychology of hindu nationalism because of which the minorities are targeted and i must tell you as minorities are targeted there is a polarization and as polarization deepens the fascist forces become stronger at least in cow belt you see cow belt they are there and close to your state in karnataka also they tried to bring in this polarization through baba budan giri darga through idga maidan and through tipu sultan lately they are trying to have a foothold in karnataka also i am very glad that kerala tamil nadu and other states are free from such a uh, such a very negative sentiment which keeps us separate as regionalist or depending on our religion so when we remember mahatma gandhi we basically have to remember number one that state has to be totally secular one example i'll give you these days we are seeing our prime minister inaugurating one temple after the other and after independence when somnath temple there was a demand from people that somnath temple should be reconstructed mahatma gandhi said state has no business to construct these temples number 2 nearly 100 people have been lynched after 1914 in the name of cow mahatma gandhi was approached in 1947 by rajendra prasad saying that many people want that state should uh, ban cow slaughter mahatma gandhi said that india it, it is not only hindus who are living in india we have to consider people from other religion also and such a policy should never take place third in the name of conversion in the name of conversion christian missionaries are being beaten in the name of conversion muslims are targeted from olden history i will not go into that mahatma gandhi was very clear that all religions are our religions religions do not have nationality different nations can have different religions look at buddhism which was born here it is a major religion of southeast asia it is a major religion of thailand and other countries like that so gandhi was very clear on those issues which based on which the saffron forces are strengthening themselves dividing the country and trying to make themselves more powerful and lastly what do we do that question is very important i am just winding up don't worry uh, that question is very important i think the major question thing which they have created is through control of media control of state institutions election commission influence on judiciary influence on uh, independent agencies like cbi enforcement directorate infiltration in police military that is one side secondly creating a mass psychology where they try to say that hindus are in danger there is no such thing of hindus being in danger they are 79% all our top leadership belongs to that religion there is this is a just a construct to target muslims and also christians so friends what do we do to revive i am glad that you took up the issue of mahatma gandhi and mahatma gandhi gives us a lot to learn in a semi secularized society like ours in a colonial society where religions hold was not totally uh, done away with in that place how do we remember gandhi and the best tribute to gandhi can be that as godse is being more and more glorified on 30th january many people are trying to have gandhi's images being shot at like punam shakun pande did in merit the statues of godse are coming up godse is being glorified so we need to see that the principles of indian constitution are strengthened the hate which has been constructed which has been brought up needs to be negated by giving the truth of our history by giving the truth of our religious minorities and our diversity our pluralism our multilingualistic uh, strength which 
of course late, lately amit shah has said that all all our correspondence should be in hindi and hindi should be the main language now they are reviving the history to prove that aryans were the original natives and so aryan race importance being given to aryan race is also there so friends like you can do a lot protect your state and strengthen these values which in your state the great people like uh, ramasami periyar uh, ramasami naikar brought forward of course he i i must say he is a shining star from your state who came out with the question of self respect which is one of the aspects of our constitution in the form of liberty equality fraternity so while paying tribute to mahatma gandhi i request you i urge upon you i feel that those values of gandhi which match with the indian constitution those should be strengthened and the sefran groups who are spreading hatred not only against muslims and christians lately against gandhi nehru and other freedom fighters those should be combated in a proper spirit and our even in case of tamil nadu the dravidian spirit the the culture the dravidian culture its centrality to the life in tamil nadu needs to be strengthened so that we don't fall prey to these very wily people so far you have kept them away thank you very much but don't be very sure that they can't creep in through some or the other mechanisms you must be seeing what your governor did when he was asked to give give a speech this is this is latest thing to control the state governments through governors who are just supposed to be uh figureheads they are being activated to curtail the state governments so with this friends i thank you very much if there are some questions i will try to answer them and i congratulate you for again for taking up this issue and recognizing that the biggest danger to india is from the politics in the name of religion thank you very much thank you sir for such an illuminating address it has given us a lot of courage and strength in this fight against fascism and we thank you on behalf of the anti fascist people's front thank you and thoral avurudiye ipo matru